Hey, this is Mr. Mitchell with another video. This particular video is about organic compounds and polymers and redox reactions and combustion, several things in this video. Let's talk first about organic compounds. Organic compounds are covalent and they include carbon every time and hydrogen most of the time. So covalent means that they are on from the right side of the periodic table here. Now I'm skipping ahead to the redoxes, but I'm not going to talk about it. Remember covalent, you have these right here plus hydrogen. So it's only going to find an, an organic compound when you have those and one of the things in it has to be carbon. These organic compounds can include many different compounds, including sorbitol, which looks like this, and you can see it has carbon all over it and a lot of hydrogens in it as well, a little bit of oxygen. And in Diet Coke and other uh, carbonated beverages, you have the sweetener aspartame, which actually looks a little bit like this, and you can see carbon and hydrogen all over it, a little bit of oxygen. You can kind of see what most of these organic compounds are made of. When a compound is made of only one, my bad, when a compound is made of only carbon and hydrogen, only carbon and hydrogen, then it is called a hydrocarbon. So the ones from before, these were not hydrocarbons because of that oxygen in here. But here are some hydrocarbons. The simplest hydrocarbon is methane, which is CH4, and you can see the CH4 here. Let me get this red marker here. This is the simplest one because it has carbon and it has four, meth four hydrogens. Now, why does it have four hydrogens? If you look back on the periodic table, look where carbon is. Carbon is right here, which means it has a valence of four. It has a valence of four, so hydrogen here is going to have one electron to give. So every one of these hydrogens gives that one electron, and sure enough, that fits well with the with the valence. So that you end up having them share the eight. So that that's the simplest one, but you can see there are a lot more complicated hydrocarbons than that. Methane forms when living matter decays. In fact, we have methane that emits from our body at periodic times. Uh, a carbon atom may also form double bonds, and it also may form triple bonds, but it cannot share more than its four total valence electrons. So if you were to take a look at these bonds here, you may remember one line means a single bond. But if you have two lines together, that means a double bond. And if you have three lines together, that means a triple bond. And the bond depends on how many electrons it is sharing. The carbon here is only sharing one electron with this hydrogen, one electron with this hydrogen, one electron with this hydrogen, one electron with this hydrogen. And that's what this indicates. So whenever you have these single bonds, only one electron is being shared with all of these things that are that are bonding. Alkanes, ding 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 right here, alkanes are hydrocarbons that just have the one single bond. So this right down here is an alkane because you do not see any double bonds at all. Ethane, which is C2H6, has a C to C bond. Now this happens to not be ethane because it has more than two C's, but you can see that you have C to C single bonds. So if you take this C right here, for example, it is sharing one electron with a hydrogen, one electron with this hydrogen, one electron with this hydrogen, and one electron with this hydrogen. You know it's one electron my bad, with this carbon you know it's one electron because it is a single bond right here. Just have that one line. And that's how alkanes can have many, many, many carbons in them. If you look at some of these, you have uh, some of the things you find in gasoline and diesel and motor oil and plastic. And gosh, you can't even count how many carbons there are in this particular bond right here. 
So it just kind of goes uh, in a straight line, you might say. If you look at all of these, you have the carbons connected like a like a like a piece of spaghetti, and you have the hydrogens coming from it. Now it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, simpler hydrocarbons, and you can see even some complex ones, uh, do form a straight line. How other, however, others have more complicated patterns like this. You can see this is part of straight line, but it does kind of go up and out a little bit. Now there's something called alkenes. Alkenes is similar to alkanes. Now remember the alkanes, you just had the single bond. So I bet you might can guess what happens in an alkene. In an alkene, you have at least one double bond. And I can see a double bond right here, and I can see a double bond right here, and I can see a double bond right here. So that's kind of a simple, simple difference right there. So they have at least one double covalent bond, and it has to be between carbon atoms. Uh, the chemical formulas for alkanes follow the pattern, and sure enough, I went to the wrong paragraph. Sorry, let me skip back down. Ethene, C2H4 is one. Oh, here is that. Uh, propene, C3H6 is another. And then you have uh, alcohols. Alcohols include carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So in these alkenes and alkanes, you didn't see an oxygen. I seem to remember seeing an oxygen way back here. Yeah, this, this has oxygen here. So since this is just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, that is considered an alcohol. No, whenever we think of alcohol, we think of some kind of drink, which you're not really supposed to drink. But this is kind of more of a chemical definition. And sure, they do have, they are related, but you don't want to just start picking up and drinking all of this. Well, you don't want to drink the alcohol anyway. Uh, so alcohols include carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They all have an OH in them because the O's and the H's do kind of seem to fit together, even though they have a negative charge to them. Uh, methanol, CH3OH, and ethanol, CH3CH2OH, are some, and they're getting kind of long right there. Let's talk now about another term you'll hear in chemistry called polymers. Polymers are long chains of organic molecules. You saw that alkanes can be long chains of organic molecules also, and they are polymers too. Oops, went to the wrong slide. But these polymers, I, I, they kind of resemble spaghetti. They kind of resemble spaghetti because you have these carbons in the middle. Now notice you have different representations like blue and red and white dots. So that means it's more than just the carbon. These are probably, uh, the dots are hydrogens probably and the, the reds and the blues. Probably one is an oxygen and the other one I'm not sure what it would be. Maybe a nitrogen. But these are long chains of organic molecules. Uh, milk jugs volleyball nets, rubber bands, they're all man-made polymers. Now polymers are easily molded. They're easily molded and that's why they kind of have a little bit of a flexibility and in some case an elasticity to it. Um, we actually have uh, some polymers that are not man-made that come in nature. The double helix of our DNA right here is a natural polymer. Now let's get to something called a reduction, oxidation, oh, what can you call it? Compound, I guess you might say. I guess it'd be better to say a reduction, oxidation, reaction. It's sometimes called redox. Reduction, oxidation. We know from ionic compounds that electrons are lost and gained in some chemical reactions. If you have sodium chloride, for example, the sodium loses an ion and the chlorine needs an ion. So you have the Na, which has a negative uh, leaving it, so that means it has a positive charge, and you have the Cl, which now has a negative charge because it has the extra ion. You may remember that. 
But the, the redox reaction has that electron transfer, so you've actually studied some redox reactions already. You just haven't written them down like you'll see most redox reactions. Every atom has what's called an oxidation number, which for our purposes is the same as a lost or gained electron. So when you think of redox, think of oil rig. Yes, oil rig. You can see right down here, oil rig. Oxidation is lost. So which one of these lost an electron? Oh, it's going to be sodium. Sodium lost the electron going this way. Which one is a gain? It's reduction. Chlorine is the one that is reduced. So you have down here some formulas. You have 2H plus 2F equals 2HF. Hmm, which one of these lost an electron and which one of these gained? Well, the electron went from here over to here. So the one that was losing an electron is hydrogen. So hydrogen since it lost, is being oxidized, and fluorine, since it gained an electron, is being reduced. So that, that kind of what will happen is that all those on this left side will end up losing electrons, so they'll be the ones that are oxidized, and the ones that are over here are primarily the ones that will be reduced. So maybe that will make things easier when you hear of a redox reaction it involves the charges being go going from one to another element, and the ones that lose are oxidized, the ones that gains are reduced. So, when a covalent bond is broken, that brings us to this next slide. When a covalent bond is broken so that at least one unpaired electron is left on each fragment of the molecule. These fragments are called radicals. Sometimes you'll hear them called free radicals. So say you have some kind of compound here and something breaks. What you have left is a radical. And these radicals will quickly form covalent bonds with other subjects. Now that kind of gives free radicals a bad name. Because say this happens in your body, there's no telling what it will react with. And uh, I know a lot of people who are kind of into fitness might be wanting to not have free radicals. But it seems to me kind of a natural thing. In fact, it happens inside our mitochondria that you have these covalent bonds that break up. And then what is left, these radicals will quickly form bonds with other subjects, substances. These often bond with oxygen because, well, oxygen has a valence of six, and since you're making covalent bonds, a pair will simply fit in with oxygen to be shared. These uh, free radicals help make long chain polymers. You know, the polymers have the long spaghetti-like chain. When coal is burned, radicals, uh, free radicals they're sometimes called, are sometimes formed. And like I said, radicals are also formed in the mitochondria. I think there's actually something, some antioxidant you can take to stop these radicals in your body. But uh, this is for another time, I suppose, and in another class. Combustion, finally, is in a chemical reaction in which fuel combines with oxygen. The most common types of fuel are organic matters that contain carbon and hydrogen. So whenever you're looking on this side of the equation, you have an O2. Now, you're not looking for just anything that happens to have oxygen in it. You're looking for O2. If you have like H2O on this side, that's not going to combust because, you know, combust means make fire out of these things actually have, these things are actually flammable and fire comes as a result of these combustion equations. So notice what goes with the oxygen is some kind of carbon and or hydrogen. And that is the case in almost all of these. So that kind of gives you a tip that you have a combustion reaction. Hey, I know we've been over a lot as far as organic compounds, redox, polymers, uh, radicals and so on, but hopefully you've learned a little bit about all of these things.